Coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing podcast. Once that box is full, and usually I know it's full when I start hearing the same stories over and over again, I'm like, okay, I think I've got enough. I mean, you can never do enough reporting, but at some point you do have to stop. And then so, you know, the whole time your mind is, is sort of subconsciously writing this thing. It's organizing these puzzle pieces. already. You're, they're already being organized in your head a little bit. But the process of writing is dumping all those damn pieces on the floor and trying to figure out how they all fit. That was Monty Burke describing his process of reporting and writing the next big book. Giant Tarpon Lefty McGuane and the corruption around the chase for Giant Tarpon. Today on The Swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsor, Waters West Fly Fishing Outfitters is your go-to resource for swung fly techniques, two-handed casting, and anatomous fish. Find out why Waters West has built a cult-like following around their fly time materials and why they are the go-to resource for the OP and beyond. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash waterswest right now to check in with Ed and Kyle and get all geared up to get on the water. Hey, how are you doing today? Thanks for stopping by the show. Please support this podcast quickly right now. If you have a past episode you'd like to share, this could be a good one right now. Click that share button in your app and share the love. Thanks in advance if you had a chance to share this week. Today's episode is sponsored by Daiichi Fishing Hooks, a leader in the fly fishing industry and still the world's sharpest hook. Tempered with carbon-rich steel, Daiichi offers superior penetration without compromising the hook's structural integrity. You can head over right now to wetflyswing.com slash Daiichi and check out what they have going and check out these killer hooks. That's Daiichi, D-A-I-I-C-H-I. Monty Burke is here to take us into the Lords of the Fly book and the crazy stories around this quest for giant tarpon. We discover and uh, find out who some of the famous people that were involved in this era, and uh, we find out what went wrong and how this obsession changed the lives for many uh, during this time period, and we get some crazy stories along the way. Plus, we find out the story of Nick Saban and the book that Monty also wrote here. So we're going to dig into this story of one of the great football coaches of all time. So here we go. Monty Burke from MontyBurke.com. How you doing, Monty? I'm doing great. Thanks. How are you? Good. Good. Thanks for uh, setting aside a little time today to dig into. Um, you've got some really great books out there. I haven't read them all, but uh, I mean, one of them I think that you come up a lot on search for is the uh, Lords of the Fly, which... You know, when you first hear that, you think of um, Lord of the Flies, right? Or at least I did, you know, that, that movie, <laughs> book movie back in the day. And well, tell me this, has yours turned into a movie yet? No, I did. Someone uh, asked about it about two months ago, but I haven't followed up. And by the way, the similarity to William Golding's classic Lord of the Flies, uh, I think has helped with sales. I I, I have this picture of like, a, you know, I, I picture like a sixth grader walking into class um, you know, supposed to read Lord of the, Lord of the Flies and, and ends up with my book instead. Right. And I, and I hope right. that's happened all over the country. That's it. And they become a <laughs> great fly angler. Well, it's, uh, right. it's a great story. And it's really interesting because, and, and you're writing too. You know, you're writing. I mean, I think it reminds me, you know, we've had John Gearock on and I'm sure you know of him. I mean, a, yep. a couple of times and, you know, your writing reminds me of his quite a bit. So I don't know, maybe we'll talk about that as we go, kind of your background. But let's jump into, first, before we get into the books and everything, talk about how you first got into fly fishing, and then we'll take it back and talk about uh, everything you have going. Okay. So, you know, it's it's something that my grandfather, my uncle, my dad, you know, everybody, the, the males in my family all fly fished. But I, I would say when I really got into it, we moved to North Carolina in fourth grade. And uh, we, we lived on a farm and we had this kind of black water pond that was like usually half covered with algae. Um, but the half that didn't have algae on it was incredible fishing. So I would literally take one of my grandfather. He had this, he'd given me a bunch of his old rods, which were old like Orvis cane rods. And a lot of them were sort of, you know, bent the way that, you know, old wooden tennis rackets would be bent. And, uh, you know, I go down there, I probably had a two foot leader maybe. And a big, I remember my first fly I ever had was a big bumblebee fly. And, you know, you go down there in the spring, it was just amazing. And it was a great way to learn how to, how to fly fish. Cause you would, you know, there were lots of hookups with brim, but also huge bass. 
and I just got totally into it. I would go down there, you know, any t- when I wasn't, you know, didn't have practice or something like that, sports practice, I would run down there and fish all the time. And then, you know, that sort of evolved. You know, I went to school, I went to a college in Vermont, so I started trout fishing up there, and then uh, spent my summers out in uh, Ketchum, Idaho, and got that's when I sort of really turned it up. It would fish the uh, the big wood at night, uh, the caddis hatch, the famous caddis hatch out there, but probably most importantly, the Silver Creek. You know, really learning how to catch or how to fish for technical trout that just kind of blew my mind. And then from there on, I got completely serious about it. I moved to DC after college and I used to, you know, drive either north to uh, the small spring creeks like the Latour Spring Run, uh, which were, you know, an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes north, or I'd go. There's actually a lot of people don't know this, but there are a lot of great little spring creeks in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. So I would, I would go there and I just went absolutely gonzo. And then, you know, later on would find the salt. And, uh, you know, it was just, it's sort of the, I, you know, I, I don't think it's too dissimilar. I'm not so sure a lot of people start with bass, but I think the sort of going from trout and then moving into maybe striped bass or whatever, and then eventually getting to bonefish and tarpon, you know, it's, it's a, a familiar evolution, I would say. It is. And, and also the influence of like your grandfather, you know, that was, there's always somebody that kind of plants the seed and, you know, Absolutely. you, you kind of got the bug early. Was your grandfather the only one in your family that fly fish or were there others? No, my, so my dad did, my dad was more of a bird hunter, but he did uh, fly fish uh, and he was pretty good at it. My uncle fly fish quite a bit uh, and like, you know, kind of traveled the world and actually was with him. Uh, that I caught my first Atlantic salmon. I think that's now been 35 years, I think, on a, a pool on the Marguerite River in Cape Breton. And it just so happens that we we together bought a, um, a plot of land and then built a cabin right above that same pool. Um, so it's very cool. Every time we go there, the first thing I do, I probably even unpack my bags. You know, we drive up there. I go down to that pool and just take a look. Um, that's you know, awesome. So, yeah, so it's very much kind of a family thing. I think I've taken it maybe to more of an extreme than... Then my siblings, uh, certainly not my uncle's pretty addicted to it too, but, um, you know, it's a, it's a big, I just got back from a tarpon trip actually in Everglades. It's a pretty big part of my life. I mean, you know, I have three kids and full-time job and everything like that. So, uh, I don't do it as much as I'd like to, uh, but no, it's a pretty, you know, I sort of plan my spring, summer and fall around the fishing. Around the fishing. Exactly. And, uh, and then the writing, so how did the writing, uh, you've got a number of books out there. How, how did mm-hmm. you, uh, how'd you get into all that? You know, I, I don't, it's an odd, kind of an odd story. I always wanted to be a writer. And it, when I went to college back in the day, but he, you know, kind of had a liberal arts degree. And so you wrote a lot. And so I always loved it. Always loved it. I, I didn't necessarily have the balls to be like, all right, I'm going to make this into a career. And actually I, out of college, applied for uh, business school, thinking I'm the oldest of three boys. I thought this was the right thing to do to pave the way, to show the way, to be the responsible one. And it was actually in the in the writing of those essays for business school. It, it's an interesting time to kind of take stock of your life, to look back at where you've been, to look at where you are, and look at look at maybe where you want to go. And it was in the writing of those essays that I decided that I didn't really want to go to I didn't really want to go to business school. I wanted to um, be a writer, and actually, it's I ended up at the same time I, I, I went uh, when I, this, I told you I lived in DC and I was fishing the Latort spring run, which is this, you know, Charlie Fox and Vince Marinero wrote a lot about it. And it, you know, it kind of has an outsized role in, in American fly fishing, but there was one guy left from that era up there. His name was Ed Shank and he was about four foot two. And uh, he was, he was the sort of master of the Latort. And I decided I'm just going to write a story about this guy and, with no previous experience. So I wrote like a, 3,000 word, I threw in everything, 3,000 word tome about Ed Shank and have my then girlfriend, now wife, come up and take photos of me and all stuff like that. And I sent it everywhere. I sent it like to Field and Stream, but I also sent it to the New Yorker. I sent it to every, the New York Times. I sent this story everywhere. It's hilarious. This is back when you, when you mailed stories too. And uh, so I got into business school and was, you know, kind of still thinking, well, maybe I should do this. But right when I was kind of in the decision mode, I got a letter from a magazine called Sporting Classics, which is a small magazine in the South. And I'll never forget, I still have the letter up in my drawer. Uh, and the, the guy, the editor there, Chuck Wexler, said, I would love to buy your story on Latort, and I would love to pay you pay you $200 for it. And uh, I made the probably not great fiscal decision, but I think great life decision to say goodbye to business school and, and start, you know, diving into writing full-time. 
There you go. Yeah. So I, well, I ended up having, got a job at uh, Sports of Field, which was then in New York. This is the reason I moved to, I live in Brooklyn now. So the reason I moved to New York was to take a job with Sports of Field as basically a secretary, but I learned that was like my sort of getting my master's degree, I guess, was learning there from all the staff members and then worked at Forbes for about 15 years, which was a very good education as well. So yeah, Forbes, Forbes. And that's where I think, um, Topher Brown mentioned you on a recent episode. I'll put a link in the show notes to that one. That was awesome. He covered Atlantic Salmon as well. Yep. Yep. But um, he mentioned you did an article on Topher, and we might talk about that as well. Um, so you got a lot. I mean, today, you know, it's going to be hard to cover it all because you've got a bunch of books, including some of your other sports, you know, like the uh, the Saban book. Yep. And some of that stuff is interesting. But let's jump in because this, uh, you know, and again, I'm gonna have I'm gonna struggle with this all day because I'm you know it's one of those things, Lord of the Fly, Lord Lord of the Flies, right. but Lords right. of the Fly, Lords of what's the way to remember that so you don't think of the other one? Just start with the plural. The plural instead of Lord, start with yeah. Lords, and then your tongue will take you the rest of the way. Yeah, yeah. So Lords, Lords of the Fly. So this is a crazy book because of I mean a lot of the characters in it you talk about you describe you know Stu Apt you know all these giant people. I mean, it's kind of a crazy time about like when this took place. But talk about that first of all for somebody who hasn't heard about this book. What is what is it about? Describe it kind of quickly. So it's an interesting book. It's, it's not one that was the idea was not really one on, that was on my radar. Uh, I started fishing with a guy named Steve Huff. I did a story for a magazine about him in 2010, I believe, and uh, and then he invited me to come fish, and we we would fish every year, and you know we spent all this time on the boat. Then I would stay with him and his wife, and. You know, he kept mentioning this word Homosassa, which is a town in, in about 70 miles north of, of Tampa. And he would mention some of the stories there and it was pretty intriguing. Uh, and then I actually ended up doing a story on Andy Mill, who's the former U.S. ski team member who became, you know, the Tiger Woods of the Tarpon Tournament world. And he mentioned it, too. He kept mentioning it, too. And uh, eventually Andy actually called me, I think it was in 2018 or 2019, and said, hey, you know, these guys are getting old. Some of them are dying off. You've got to tell this story. And I was like, what story? He was like, this story of this time period. And, uh, you know, I was sort of intrigued enough to get a phone number from him of a guy named Tom Evans, who ends up being the kind of central character of the book. I drove up to Vermont, sat with Tom, you know, in his, his house in Grafton, Vermont for two days and just listened to the stories. And, you know, I, I think what intrigued me there are a couple things intriguing. One is that, you know, just the people, you mentioned some of the names that were in there, the, the, the names. I mean, these are people that I've been reading about since I was 12. You know, Tom Evans is probably the least known of these guys, but, you know, you had Billy Pate, you had Ted Williams, the baseball player, you had Stu Apt, you had, you know, Flip Pallet plays a role in this, Chico Fernandez plays a role in this, Al Fluger. Uh, I mean, the, the names, Lefty Cray, the, the names go on and on and on. So that was intriguing. Um, I think what was also intriguing was that I, I think you could argue, so, you know, this was a point in time when uh, this place called Home Assassin just blew up as a place that had fish that were 30 to 50 percent bigger, tarpon, 30 to 50 percent bigger than, than fish anywhere. And, uh, and people got on this kind of world record thing. And so for six or seven years, the record fell every year for uh, the fly rod fish. And, and it became this kind of incredible, you know, zoo-like atmosphere. But it was, a, I think, a time and a place that you could argue, you know, that might have been the apex of the of fly fishing. And I don't think I'm push. I don't think I'm pushing it too far when I say that because you had the world's best fly anglers at the time. All those names I just mentioned. Yeah. And what year is this, what, Monte? What what year? This is like uh, late '70s, early '80s was sort of the heyday. So it was kind of discovered by. I, I go through it in the book, but it's kind of some people knew about it and. Uh, kept their mouth shut. Lefty Cray was invited to come fish about it and he did not keep his mouth shut. So that huh. it, it kind of, it kind of had these different ways of being discovered, but Steve Huff and, and Tom Evans, Steve was Tom's guide back in, back in that day, kind of put on the map. But anyway, so you had all these, the, you know, the world's best flying anglers all together at the same time. And they all went there for a month, the month of May. You got all the world's best guides. I mean, you can you can go through the list of, of who were the greatest guides at that time. They were all there. Steve Huff, Hal Chittum, all those guys were there. They were all there, you know, trying to accomplish the same goal, which was to break the world record. And, you know, it's just, which was kind of like the holy grail of, of fly fishing at the time. And it, it created this huge, you know, I, I did all this research to create this huge 
interest. I mean, the New York Times wrote about it. Sports Illustrated did like a 10-page piece on it. Um, so that that really intrigued me just to have all those kind of characters there at the same time in the stories that they told. But what also intrigued me was kind of what, you know, what led up to it, uh, the evolution of uh, saltwater fishing, but in particular the evolution of tarpon fishing, which is one of the reasons that we, you know, so many of the things we sort of take for granted now in fishing, the, the wonderful rods, the great lines, the sharp hooks we get from Japan came from this era uh, and came from the trial and error that took place during this era. And then, um, you know, what also intrigued me is what came out of this. I mean, a homeless, a homeless assa became, the, the regulars started to call it homeless smasha because not only were rods and hooks and lines being broken, I mean, marriages, lives, the fishery itself all ended up, you know, kind of being broken. And so, you know, any, any time, uh, all of, if I had to, if there was one sort of through line through all of my books and most of the stories I've written, it, it's about obsession. Obsession just really intrigues me. And so, you know, this was sort of a, you know, it's a very, Nick Saban is uh, very obsessed as the Alabama football coach, but no, no more, no less so than Tom Evans and some of the guys who show up in this book. It's just a different, you know, little less notoriety if you're going after the world record tarpon, only a very small, you know, number <laughs> of people really give a shit about that. But Tom Evans had a great quote in there about, you know, I would fish there for a month and a half every year, but I would think about it for the rest of the year, you know, and like that just, I don't know, it just gets me when people are, or that into something. Right. And then what happened with, what happened to the fishery? What happened to the, how did it end? How did this whole like period end? So it's still, I mean, one of the reasons I did this book too, is that Tom Evans at the age of 82, well over 300 pounds because of many botched back surgeries, pretty much unable to stand for more than a couple of minutes at a time was still going down there, was still chasing this Holy grail you know, when, and, and actually was just down there this year as well. Um, he's missed like a couple of years now because of COVID and stuff like that. But so the fact that when I went up and talked to him, he was like, I'm going down this year. This was 2018 or 19. I can't remember. 19, I think. And I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, I'll come with you. You know, so, so back in that heyday, there were, and I interviewed a bunch of people about this to, to sort of, you know, make sure that it was correct. But back in the heyday, there were tens of thousands of fish of tarpon many of whom were, you know, in the 150 to 220 pound range. And, you know, what happened, it, what happens, it, you see it happen all the time, all over this, this world when it comes to fisheries or anything, really. Uh, it, it got too popular. I mean, like I, I was mentioning earlier about how the, the Times wrote about it. There were, t there were movies made about it, TV shows made about it. Pretty soon, you know, what was like 13 boats or 12 boats became like 200 boats on the water. And so I think that, you know, that's a good way to screw up a fishery is to have that many people down there. I think that working in conjunction, I mean, and that was one factor. You still have, you know, tarpon will, will tolerate humans and boats to a certain degree. You know, that was so many that I think they probably didn't tolerate it. But, but maybe more importantly, this was what happened kind of starting in the late 70s and has continued since then is this, you know, population boom in Florida and use of the uh, freshwater resources in particular for golf courses, retirement communities. I mean, that area of Florida from about the time that those guys discovered Homo Sass and the fishery there in the late seventies until now has just boomed. And they do not use their, re they do not conserve their resources. They, anyone can put a straw down and suck up water. And so you had it, this was, this is called the Springs coast down there. And the theory anyway, uh, which is backed up by a good amount of science was that those freshwater springs going into Homo Sassa Bay attracted these big blue crabs and the tarpon love these big blue, blue crabs. Oh, so they, it was a, the reason oh. they came there every year Gosh. and B it was the reason that they got so big. And then, so those Springs are, you know, I, I did a, the research and the, and laid it out in the book, but they're at 40% of their flow, their historical flow right now. Right. So it's not getting any better. It's not getting any better. And it's very typical. I mean, Florida is just a, I don't, I don't know if you're up on what's going on now with the, the algae, on the different coast and this, this huge seaweed thing, which has, according to the story I read yesterday, it's, it's not very funny, but it has flesh eating bacteria. And I mean, it is, and the Everglades is a great story too, is a, is a perfect, uh, you know, encapsulation of this whole Florida thing. They, they just don't treat Florida is like paradise, but it's being ruined, you know, and they just don't give a crap. They don't have the same protections as say, if you were to go up to some other place. Well, I mean, I guess that's the interesting thing about it because you do have 
the ESA, right? You do have the same federal standards for protecting species. And it's interesting. I guess there's just a lot of politics there that don't. They just don't. When it comes to water in particular and shoreline development, Florida does not give a crap. I mean, it clearly doesn't. They always side on the on the side on the side of the developers. Every time you build a condo or a high rise on a shoreline in in Florida, you are ruining marsh, uh, you're ruining mangroves. So thus, you're ruining like rearing spots for tarpon and other fish. And every time you stick another hose or a straw down there and build another golf course you're taking away fresh water that, you know, used to flow either down to the Everglades or down, you know, the coast or whatever. So anyway, it's just a, it's a catastrophe. And it's, it is, it's one there we're actually starting to, like I said, I was just down the Everglades uh, last week. You're starting to actually see decades and decades of, uh, you know, this catastrophic kind of management of natural resources. The, the chickens are coming home to roost now. If somebody's listening now, and I know the Bonefish Tarpon Trust, there's some really, you know, good groups out there. What would be something somebody could do if they wanted to find out more, get involved in some of the conservation stuff? Is there is there anybody? There must be some people. There are uh, there there are a bunch. I would you know Bonefish Tarpon Trust would be a great place to to sort of see what's going on with the fishery. I mean they just they just discovered that they're you know the pharmaceuticals in in bonefish and redfish. Um, you know so they're they're doing kind of critical research in that way. I would say when it comes to fighting back against uh, Florida's deeply corrupt state legislator right the 40 percent of the people in of the members of uh, florida's state legislature have connections to development and real estate it's a joke so i think captains for clean water would be a great place to kind of get up on what's going on and they fight pretty hard which i like uh and vote water would be another place that i would, vote that I would look into yep perfect perfect good yeah. good well yeah and this is uh you know the story it's like you, you say i mean you got the fishing pressure but it's not just that. There's all sorts of things going on. Yeah. And um, and so today, it's like you still see, uh, so I've been down there a lot, obviously, and you still see, you know, uh, I hooked the biggest tarpon I've ever hooked in my life uh, when I was down there last year. Just, I can't even, you know, my, was what my kids would call ginormous. You know, I, I can't even describe how big this fish was, right? But you don't, you know, you go days without seeing fish. And so it's about, it's about, you know, we talked to the old timers who were there, uh, you know, it's about a tenth of its of its uh, historical capacity. And yet there are still, you know, people who go down there and love it. I mean, all the, the white heat of the tarpon world now is in the keys uh, for sure. It's kind of going back, back to the keys. You go to the keys, you sit on the ocean side, you anchor up there. You're going to see a thousand fish in a day. Now you're not going to catch many of them, if any, but you're going to see them. And so that alone is exciting enough for, you know, a lot of people. So quick break for a word from our sponsor. With more than 40 years of experience in coffee, the Angler's Coffee Team roasts a full range of coffee with one goal in mind, delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. Responsibly sourced from farms using sustainable growing practices, you can rest easy knowing you are doing your part. Roasted and shipped within 48 hours to assure freshness. For me, it's all about that freshness and taste when I crack open a bag of anglers in the morning. I feel good because I know not only does it taste great, but I am supporting great movements along the way. With a blend for every taste, a dry dropper on the go, tea bag option, and a roast sampler, you know Joe at Anglers is serving your needs. It's time to step up to better coffee and more impact for the fish species and causes we love. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash anglers right now to grab a bag of greatness today. That's Anglers, A-N-G-L-E-R-S, to make a change today. And it seems like, you know, your book, I mean, probably, you know, a lot of your stuff is, you know, the characters, right? I mean, these, so so you mentioned some of the names. I mean, it was a crazy time. It's almost like I was thinking about, it's like the sex, drugs, and rock and roll almost, right? Like sex, drugs, and Key West or whatever. Like, what was going on in that area? Was that just the you know, the days of the, whatever the, you know, that period where it was like that, or describe that a little bit, like, cause all these people got tied up in it and, yep. and you know, McGuane, you had, um, and Jimmy Buffett, right. I mean, there's all mm-hmm. sorts of people D- describe that a little bit for somebody who doesn't know, like yep. who it, it wasn't only lefty Cray. Yeah. Yeah. So you get like, it, w- what was cool about this book is that it was like this chain of unbroken events to quote check off that were all connected to each other. You know, which which I didn't really know going. I didn't know that McGuane would somehow be connected to this Homo Sassa. I didn't know that Chico Fernandez and Flip and those guys would be connected to Homo Sassa. I didn't realize that Andy Mill, in his own way, and all of the you know present day folks are also connected to Homo Sassa. So 
what what I trace in the book is the evolution of the of the sport, and you know it, it you know starts with a guy named Bill Smith catching a using a salmon fly basically to catch a bonefish on the flats, and then from there people start targeting uh, tarpon. Stu App being one of the first people to kind of start to do it, but you know when these guys in particular there were there were these you know Chico and Flip were part of this this little group of guys who were all at the University of Miami at the time and all absolute fishing nuts. I mean, they would practice casting in the parking lots at the college there. They would meet every Friday night at the same restaurant to kind of plan their weekend fishing or whatever. And, you know, they would go uh, to the bridges in Key West and other places and, you know, use the gear of the time, which was fiberglass rods, cane rods, sometimes terrible silk, silk lines, fluger reels, and try to catch these enormous fish and they couldn't do it. I mean, they would hook the fish and everything gone, all the whole line gone like that. So, you know, then they would go back and figure out, okay, what do we need here? We need a better rod. We need lines that don't break. We need uh, hooks that aren't going to bend. So they, they sort of over the years made, they, they helped kind of do the technology, make the technological advances to make this thing doable, to make it accessible. And so, you know, they were sort of the scientists, you know, fitting around in the in the laboratory figuring this thing out and they did and they did figure it out and then literally like a couple of years later the sort of uh as i describe in the book the camera kind of pans down from miami and key largo down to key west and this is you know when you had the artist kind of come in and, and discover the sport and so this is mcguane this is jim harrison this is jimmy buffett uh this is russell chatham all of whom you know were just completely obsessed with art and completely upset, you know, making art, whether it being writing or painting or whatever, and obsessed with tarpon fishing. And they would go, you know, they had a great time down there. They would, they rented a house and they would party like rock stars. Right. So it was tarpon. So tarpon for everybody. I mean, all those people, Jimmy Absolutely. Buffett, I mean, it wasn't just, tarpon they were is, going down there. For, yeah. Nope. Tarpon is what, what kind of, you know, what kind of brought them together and what brought them down there uh, every year. And, you know, tarpon fishing was kind of like, you know, art is kind of the trying to express the unex- inexpressible and tarpon fishing is sort of like that. Um, you know, it's like, it's a very hard thing to describe a tarpon bite unless you've had one. Uh, I tried a couple times in the book. There's a poet named Richard Brodigan who was part of that group down in Key West. And he described it. I think the best way I've ever seen, he called it immediate unreality, which is exactly what it feels like. You were thrown into something. You're like, what the hell just, that- what is happening to me right now? You know? And so, it was cool to have these guys come down. They made a film called Tarpon, which was this, you know, it was not released right away, but became this underground kind of like, you know, you could get it. I remember watching a VHS copy with a friend of mine in Montana in 1994 or something like that, you know. But it, but it, they made it, as artists do, they made it cool. They made it look cool. You know, I mean, they were cool looking dudes. They were having a great time. Uh, they had beautiful women with them all the time. They were you know, doing all the cool drugs back in the day, but they made it look really cool. Um, and it reminds me actually, and I write about this in the book a little bit, it reminds me of neighborhoods in New York City. So, you know, I, I don't know how familiar people are with New York City, but Soho was just a dumpy former industrial part of lower Manhattan. I actually lived there when I first moved here uh, and it was still dumpy and, you know, but it had these great high ceiling lofts and all this kind of stuff because it had been this industrial thing. And as I was there, all of these, not because of me, but all of these artists came in there and, and because the, the lofts were cheap. And so they made their art uh, there. They had their shows there. And lo and behold, they made the neighborhood cool. And what happened, what happens to all of these places when you make it cool, next thing you know, you had the hedge fund guys, you know, the lawyers, high powered businessmen come in and they buy up all the stuff. And then they are, they knock, they move all the artists out. And pretty soon they own it. They own it. And Soho is now like the nicest, you know, neighborhood in lower Manhattan. And to a certain degree, this is kind of what happened in tarpon fishing. So like McGuane, those guys made it look really cool. And then the camera pans from there, you know, they're fishing for art's sake. They're not fishing for record. They're fishing for the, for the artistic pleasure and the whole thing. Then the camera pans up to home Sassa. And this literally kind of happens in sequence, right? So it, it pans up to home Sassa, And all of a sudden you have all these people, you know, Billy Pate was a, it sold his textile company for $50 million or something like that. Al Fluger was was really wealthy. Carl Navare, who I haven't mentioned yet, was uh, you know owned all the Coca Cola bottling down. So Tom Evans was a stockbroker. So you had all these businessmen who came in. They didn't do it for art. They weren't doing it for art. 
They were doing it to break records. They were doing it for competition's sake. And so it's kind of this interesting kind of, you know, evolution that took place. Right. God, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. It's the, uh, so what is, is that what the current record, what is the world record for tarpon? So it gets, <laughs> it gets all whacked out that drove me. I did try to explain that in it in a, uh, a non-boring way in the book, but you've got line classes. So 12 pounds, 16 pound. The biggest fish ever caught is over 200 pounds. It was caught on 20 pound test, which was something that Billy Pate begged to have the IGFA, which is the International Game Fish Association, which is in charge of all these records. You know, a true purist thought that 20 pound was too heavy, uh, the tippet. They thought that you know it, it gave the advantage. So the, the whole thing is about it being fair play, right, and fair sport. And uh, they thought the 20 pound gave, the, gave too much of the advantage to the angler. So the, the one that's over 200 pounds that was caught, that's the Holy Grail. 200 pounds was the Holy Grail. It was caught by a non-regular, of course, the guy who just came in for a week with his dad and he caught it, was caught on 20 pounds. So there are a lot of people who sort of poo-poo that record, but that is the biggest, it's the biggest recorded fish on a fly rod. 200 pounds. Yep. So, but then you, know, you get down to like the 16 pound record is uh, Tom Evans has that, that's 190 pounds. And then the 12 pound record to me is the most impressive because 12 pounds is like which, what I use for bass fishing in Alabama, right? Right. Yeah. 12 pounds seems like, how the heck do you do that? And that's a 194. That's a 194 Jeez. pound fish caught on 12 pound, which is, which is just amazing. And that's also Tom Evans. So there's different, you know, within this uh, very insular world, there are various, you know, different interpretations of what the most impressive record is, but they all hover around 200, uh, the biggest ones. And, you know, so not, and not a lot of people now, what's interesting to me too, is like not, there are not a lot of people now fishing for records. It's sort of, you know, I think we realize that the seas are, are finite and that, you know, you unfortunately have to kill this. It's such a big fish. You can't keep it alive, weigh it, and then put it back like you can with a bass or something like that. They have to kill it. Oh, right. So all those fish were killed. They were killed. Yep. They were killed. And the thing about them is that they have a pretty, well, the kind of life history, maybe talk about that a little bit on the tarpon. Yep. Um, they have a pretty long lived life, right? They're such a cool, I mean, the, the, one of the most intriguing things is, is how just freaking cool they are. I mean, they're, they're, first of all, they're 50, they're 50 million years old. How would that compare, do you think, to a, let's say, a, um, you know, I mean, any other fish, right? A bass, a smallmouth bass. I wonder what the comparison is. Well, I, I don't know that exactly, but I, they are much older than a, than a bass. Uh, they just they one of the oldest you know sort of species they're like sturgeon you know and stuff like yeah, that yeah sturgeon yeah yeah uh they're they're prehistoric basically um you know smallmouth bass largemouth bass are not not really not prehistoric so and you know not only that so they've been around forever i mean we live in the tarpons world uh, they don't live in ours you know we're a blip on their on their lifespan but individually too they can live to 70 sometimes close to 80 years old so these are these are long lived fish there was one famous tarpon that was captured during a hurricane down in texas and brought up to the shed aquarium which is a famous aquarium in chicago and uh, it lived to 77 and so you know you you I, I just love the fact that they're that they are this incredibly old species and that you know people like tom evans and other people who, who've been going to home sassa for i mean there's there's a fairly good chance i point this out in the book there's there's an outside chance that some of the fish that tom first saw in 1977 when he first went there he might see or might have seen in recent years. I mean, it, it, it just, it just could, ha you know, statistically it could happen or whatever, but, and they you know, they're, they're just cool animals to begin with. I mean, they, we have no idea really, even though the BTT has tried to figure this out, what they do for most of their lives. I mean, they're, they're denizens of the, of the deepest ocean. We know more about Mars than we know about the deepest ocean. All right. And so they spend a lot of their time there and yet they come shallow every year in a kind of pre-spawning kind of deal and and we can connect with them which is so cool and they're the biggest you know by far the biggest most acrobatic most incredible fish that you can come in in contact with with a fly rod you know i guess a marlin a marlin would be would be bigger and whatnot but you're on a big boat and you're teasing it up and all that kind of crap i mean this is real organic stuff right you know you're, you're sitting on the babble boat you see one you toss to it with a your five ounce gra graphite rod and so they're just such remarkable animals and what what's always uh, I write about this in the book too. There's like, there's, there's for me uh, every morning when I'm having breakfast before I'm going out and I know there's a good chance I might catch a big tarpon, which, which is, I think like a hundred pounds and bigger. 
I have this incredible excitement and anticipation, but I also have this tiny nagging bit of fear because it is no joke when you tangle with one, especially if you get to, you know, ones that are over 150 or whatever, you know, the agony that you and the fish will go through while you're fighting it. I mean, what, what's cool about tarpon is I think they're one of the few, if not the only, maybe again with marlin animals that we go after that, that fight back, that really truly fight back. You know, when you, when you catch a bonefish or you catch a salmon or trout, usually you hook it, you hold your rod up, you let them kind of tire, you, you know, you put a little pressure on or whatever, but you kind of let them tire out, tire themselves out. If you do that with a tarpon, you're screwed. You're going to be in Billy Pate fought a tarpon once for 12 hours. Jeez. Same thing. Yep. And so you, I mean, you were, cause, cause they get a second wind and sometimes the second wind is even, they get like more energy for whatever reason. So you have to be constantly with almost all of your might pulling on this fish and you learn how to do it. You know, the more, the longer you do it, you learn how to kind of pull with your body, not your arms, stuff like that. And you can get really good at it. I mean, Tom Evans and, and, uh, Andy Mill are particularly good at, at using leverage, uh, at using different, you know, keeping pressure on the fish and they can usually land the fish in 30 minutes, a big fish. Uh, but for a lot of people, I mean, you just a you have they either have no chance of landing it. The fish is going to eventually just just waste them, or they spend hours and hours fighting a fish, which is bad for them and bad for the fish. But but it's but but that sort of uh, Kant, uh, the philosopher writer, described the sublime as beauty mixed with terror, and I've always thought that's what big tarpon fishing is. You know, like, that's what it is. Right. Right, Terry. Yeah, because that's God. This is crazy. So, so, and that's the thing about the age too. The the old live fish is is tough too because when you kill them, it takes a long time to replace a seventy yep. year old fish. Right. Yep. Now, to be sure, the the record chasers are not. When it comes to you know tarpon, are kind of in a in a little bit of a pickle right now when it comes to their population size and, but tar, record hunters are not. They're not really the problem. The problem is more uh, because there are so few of them now anyway. Um, and it, well, it's the water and it's, you know, there's a couple aggregate aggregation spots where sharks have kind of gotten wise to uh, release tarpon, which are weaker. And so, you know, Boca Grand Pass would be one, the bridges in, in the Keys would be others, where all the time now, you know, people release the tarpon and boom, they're hit by a hammerhead or hit by a bull shark or something like that. So, you know, there's there's other bigger problems, I would say, now than, than the record hunters. But yeah, you don't want to, I mean, killing one of these fishes, I, I, that's one thing I never, I have a whole chapter on <laughs> like the moral, the moral dilemma of, uh, even writing about this, like, cause I, I'm would not, I don't really wouldn't care if I caught it, if I broke that record by 30 pounds, there's no way I'm killing that fish. No way. No. Well, that must be kind of one of the inter- or kind of crazy things about it. You had all these guys, which yeah, from like, kind of like the rock stars all the way down. But when those people look back on it, I'm not sure how many of them are alive, but you talked about a lot of names here. I mean, how do you think they look back at that? Like flip Pallet, for example, does he look back at that and they say, gosh, what were we doing? killing all those fish yeah i mean I, I think it's you know it's a lot like maybe cigarette smoke in the united states you know i mean used to, used to be people could smoke on planes you know it's like things change when when you get more information and they you know when you when people start to realize like this is just like because you can't eat tarpon i mean you can oh but, yeah you can't even eat them that's the other thing there's yeah. no that's the reason part of the, really they've been they're still around probably yeah i mean there's some south american countries do eat them but uh, but not much right it's not really like commercial harvested fish so what a waste, you know, but, but I think back in the day, the sea seemed, you know, ever replenishing and infinitely populated and, you know, so it didn't really matter. So this is a conservation ethic. I think that's kind of, it not only happened there, obviously, but happened with, I mean, God, I mean, I, I just went to, a, um, just in Vermont in this old cool fishing shack and the pictures there in the seventies of the trout that people killed from the batten kill is insane. You know, I mean, it's like they would lay out six or seven huge trout and you're like, man, they're all dead, dude, you know, and like they did that every day, you know, so. Yeah, that was just the time. Yeah, that's the thing. It's not, and it's not specific to tarpon. You could look at any back in the day, absolutely you know, the lines of fish, whether that's steelhead it, it, or Atlantic salmon. Atlantic or, salmon too. I know yeah. things, things that you wouldn't even, you know. And even salmon, this is the, the thing that shows you like it just, you know, history keeps repeating itself, right? I mean, you look up to Alaska and the same thing. It's like not too long ago, like, God, the unlimited supply of Alaska now Chinook salmon. Yep. Right. Or, yep. or kind of tanking. And and so, again, I think it's it's one of those weird things like, wow, I guess we have a hard time learning from our mistakes. But then also it's like we just have a growing population. And at the end of the day, it's like one of those things, right? You got to feed your family. And that comes first before the environment. Do you feel yep. like that's kind of where we are still? Do I feel like that? 
Yeah. Do you, do you think just overall, I mean, I know there's a lot of conservation groups, but it feels like I don't dig tons into the conservation, but occasionally, you know, we talk about this and it feels like, you know, there's two schools of thought. There's those people that think like, hey, you know, this is tanking and let's just let's uh, embrace the, the uh, you know, the non-native fish because they're going to yeah. be here for the long term. And then there's other people that are like, dude, we got to stop doing everything and just like shut down. And right. So what, what do you think is the, you know, what, what's your take on that? I just, you know, I think I think it's actually an individual. First of all, you got to you got to play by we got to obey the rules, the laws, right? So, like, I I do I striper fish a lot up here in New York, and I do see people, you know, keeping uh, fish that are outside the slot, and that that just drives me absolutely bad, right? So, obey the rules first of all. But I also think, you know, it's individually it comes. It, it, you have to you have to and you should every once in a while grapple with the moral implications of what you're doing because whether you're catching and releasing that that doesn't absolve you of anything yeah even catching it all even literally just right. catching a fish has an impact right. even standing in the river kind of or whatever whatever you're doing like you have an impact on, on what's going on so i've always thought and i still it, and i still think this and the day that i don't think this is the day i might stop fishing that but i think that angling anglers lots of anglers not all of them but lots of them and angling groups serve more good than than bad in other words i think without the atlantic salmon federation there would be far, far fewer Atlantic salmon. Uh, I think without trout unlimited fighting for wetlands and habitats, there would be far fewer trout. Uh, I, I, without BTT, which is all anglers, very, I don't think there's anyone in that group that is that is that has not angled. You know, there would be no research being done on bonefish and permit and tarpon. So, I do. And captains for clean water is a great example too. I mean, those are cap. Those are those are fishing guides, right? And so, as long as that balance, you know, it's it it sounds. To someone who doesn't fish or whatever, they're like, "Well, why don't you just stop fishing?" Like, like, right? Uh, you know? Yep. No, no, that's a great point. I love that point. You, we protect what we love, is what Leopold, Aldo Leopold, that's right. once said. And so, as long as that balance, as long as that is kind of working in, in the favor of the angling groups, I'm all for it. I do think about a lot more. You know, I, I, I don't know. I find myself now trying to like fishing for difficult fish a lot more. Like, I don't love going out. You know, you can you can here in the fall, you can go out and on a boat when the false albacore and you can catch like 20 and they're spectacular fish. They're great great it's i wouldn't call it it's still not easy but you can catch 20 easier than catching a, a bunch of tarpon right, or, or just easier for what i do for, for albies now is i go to shore points right and i fish either off jetties or places where they come in every once in a while they don't come some days they don't come in at all and you're just sitting there you know picking your nose while the boat guys are catching all the fish but to me it's much more gratifying they do come in, you get your one shot, maybe they come in twice, you get two shots or whatever, and you get one. Like, wow, like that was really gratifying, you know? And so, I don't know. And then fishing for Atlantic salmon is like always difficult. You just don't, you, just don't, you know, you don't have days where you catch 20. You just don't, you know? So kind of like that. That's it. So so basically going back, you know, to the book, you know, the, if somebody was going to read this, they would basically hear about all these stories and then they would yep. there would be some ending. Maybe give us without, you know, the, the kind of the, the end of the book. What What is the. Well, so there there are a lot more stories in there, too, by the way. I mean, go all the way back to the history of it. I go back and uh, talk about the contemporary stuff. There's a there's a gangster who makes a who uh, uh, has a whole chapter. You know, Miami gangster who was really into this, who I just loved. It was someone that I didn't know about beforehand and found him and he helped actually found Abel Reels. I mean, it was like this crazy, weird connections. Um, how it ends is uh, probably my, some of the most gratifying kind of writing I've, I've done actually in my career was, was with Tom Evans and trying to answer the fundamental kind of question of the book, which is why? Why do this? You know, why? for 45 years of your life if you spent a month in homo sasa you know and so I, I, and I and i think it's i think it's answered somewhat with the last line so i won't spoil it but there you go there you go that's amazing and uh cool well th this is really this is really awesome um and you have a few other books right we've been just hitting on yep. this talk about one because i know uh, it's nick saban right uh-huh Nick Saban, yeah, I mean, and I know I'm not a huge sport fanatic, but I played sports, you know, throughout my life and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, Saban was just one of those guys where even though I wasn't a big football player or didn't even watch it that much, you, you knew about that guy. And yeah. He definitely won some championships. Give us a little snippet on what that book, what we could well, expect. So he was always fascinating to me because he, he's a divisive character because he's, uh, I think now, inarguably, he's the best college football coach of all time. Oh, wow. However... 
he's left programs, you know, after only being there for a couple of years and pissed off entire states. I mean, he, and he, and he had a failed tenure by his standards anyway, a failed tenure in the, in the pros with the Miami Dolphins. So, you know, to me, he was a, I grew up in Alabama for a little while. Um, and my, my granddad used to take me, there was another iconic coach in Alabama named Bear Bryant. You probably yeah, heard Bear that, Bryant. Oh, that yeah. name. And so my grandfather used to do when I was little, when I was like 10 would take me to go see Bear Bryant. And a, my grandfather was a, was a, a drinking buddy of Bear Bryant's, but that was not an unusual, that was not a unique uh, uh, position. There were, he had, Bear Bryant had many drinking buddies. But anyway, so I kind of was like, you know, I, I had Alabama football a little bit in my blood. And um, when Saban left the Dolphins, so he, he had this very good college career where he won a national title. With Alabama. Well, no, this is, this is pre-Alabama. So he coached at Michigan State. He won a national title at LSU. And then the Dolphins, owner, which was Wayne Huizenga, who started Blockbuster, threw a ton of money at him, said, come coach the Dolphins. So he comes, he goes there and does not have much success. But the real football aficionados, he, he chose Dante Culpepper over Drew Brees. Drew Brees ended up playing for the Saints oh, and having a Hall of Fame career. So anyway, Dante Culpepper, has two, right? yeah, I always love that name, Dante Culpepper. <laughs> yeah, that's a good name. So he has two not very good seasons, mediocre seasons at the Dolphins. And then he, and then dramatically he says, I'm not leaving the Dolphins. And then he leaves and goes to Alabama yet again. I mean, this is kind of what he did. Uh, his whole career. Right. And then he has kind of a not great year again. Uh, his first year at Alabama was like seven and six or something like that. So I was a reporter at Forbes at the time. And uh, I was like, man, I mean, this is a great rebuilding story. And it kind of like, I know a lot about football and I've followed his career or whatever. So I called him up. I wrote him a letter actually. And uh, I never forget, I was sitting in my office uh, one day and the phone rang and uh, it said Alabama Athletics or something like that. And I picked it up and I was like, Mona, this is Nick Saban. You can come on down and do that story if you want. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I went down, I spent three days with him, follow him around. This is in his second season. And you could really tell that he was like, he had gotten, the ship had turned and he was the, he was the captain and everyone was, was marching to the same orders. You know, I mean, you could tell that this was, what he was doing here was, and, and I remember one time I was having lunch with him in his office and the phone, his secretary came in and said, so-and-so is on the line. He said, I'm sorry, this is a recruiting call. You're going to have to step out. So I ran out to my car, which is in the parking lot, and called my wife and called a good buddy of mine and said, this is huge. The story is freaking huge. And uh, you know, I was just so excited about it. So anyway, so I got back. I wrote the story. It was on the cover of Forbes. It actually was the, I don't know if it still holds this record, but it was the highest selling single issue of the magazine ever. And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just saying yeah. the Alabama people are crazy. They all bought like three or four copies. And what was the story? Was it just like the return of? Yeah, it was like the rebuild. Uh, it was. It was. It was. Actually, I would think it was called like Sports Most Powerful Coach. Like basically, Alabama gave him the keys to that mansion and said, "Do whatever you want, dude. Whatever you want to do." And he brought back, and they won a championship. He won one not that year, but he won one the year after, and then subsequently won five more or something like. You know? Oh, so, he did. He won a bunch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So anyway, so no one had really written a book about like, where'd this guy come from? You know, so like I went uh, back to his, his roots. He grew up in a little coal mining, tiny coal mining town in West Virginia and was one of the few that got out of there without having, you know, not going down into the mines and all, all because of football. Um, and all, and he's just, a, you know, he coached with, he became friends with and learned a lot uh, from Bill Belichick, who's the coach of the Patriots. I mean, so I traced his whole, like literally from before his birth, when his parents met. Uh, all the way up to like the 2016 or 17 season. I can't remember like that, but it was, it was really, really fun. I mean, unbelievably fun. I'm, I'm completely, you know, like I said, obsessed with obsessed people. How do you write? How do you write? I'm curious on the writing. I know I mentioned John Gierak at the start mm -hmm. and he's obviously a big uh, influence in fly fishing and fishing and just in general, but he mentioned like, you know, writing, you know, you don't want to write like your, you know, A to B, right? Here's A to Z or whatever. Like, you, you know, it's be like listening to your uncles. I think the way John said, it's like, you don't want to be like listening to your uncle's Hawaii vacation. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. how do you write where it's not like that? I know I, I haven't read this book, but I'm just curious. Do you, you know, and, and then getting into the questions and all that, it seems like to write a great book, like, how do you do it? That's a great question. I actually don't really... I, I don't know if there's a formula for the writing, the actual writing part. I'll, I'll just tell you my, I'll tell you my process, and I think it all kind of fills in from there. But first of all, I I read I've read a lot. I'm sort of a self-taught. I never never got a degree in writing or anything like that. But I but I read a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, and would reread and reread. And you know, I would get McGuane. You know, I, I bet I've read his story, The Longest Silence, probably seventy times in my life, and I'm not kidding. So you read it once for pleasure, and then you read it again 
and then you read it a couple more times to see like where the how how he did it, the bones or whatever. Um, but anyway, so my process is just like for a book, for instance, and even for a story to a certain degree. You know, the reporting is so important. John doesn't he writes more essays, so he doesn't necessarily he doesn't report that much. But he's such a wonderful storyteller; it doesn't really matter. But for me, anyway, I have to go out and report. So I'll talk to for the Saban book. I, I spoke to well over three hundred people. Uh, even even for Lords of Fly, I spoke to I think I spoke to 175 people or something like that. So, you know, go out, see people in their element, spend time with them, and so all of that reporting. To, to I've always likened it to like I've got a big box, and every little piece of reporting I, I get is a puzzle piece, and I throw it in that box. And once that box is full, and usually I know it's full when I start hearing the same stories over and over again. I'm like, okay, I think I've I think I've got enough. I mean, there, you can never do enough reporting. But at some point, you do have to stop. And then so, you know, the whole time your mind is, is sort of subconsciously writing this thing. It's organizing these puzzle pieces already. You're, they're be already being organized in your head a little bit. But the process of writing is dumping all those damn pieces on the floor and trying to figure out how they all fit. And then in terms of like, you don't want to be boring. And one of the, the probably the best compliment I've gotten about uh, this latest book is that it made me laugh and it made me cry. And that's exactly I mean, if you could, if there's a, a sweet spot in any in any form of entertainment. I mean, think about your favorite movies, your your favorite TV shows. Um, you know, they're the ones that make you make you laugh out loud, and then they make you you know you make you feel like crying. And so, I don't really know. I mean, I, I literally just sit down and, and and kind of grind. But I love both parts. I mean, you know, I love the reporting because it's like I'm not a natural extrovert, but it's fun to go out and make myself be an extrovert. And I love meeting people and hearing their stories, stuff like that. And I really love the right, you know, and then I usually shut myself in for eight months or whatever, grow a nasty beard. Yeah. <laughs> and literally everything, when you're really locked in, I'm sure this happens to everybody at some point, when you're really locked in, everything is feeding into this, right? I'll be walking down the street and I'll see a, a bird in a tree or remind me, oh God, that would be an interesting way to describe it. You know, so you're so locked in. And yeah, you're in the zone. You're in the zone. And it's such a wonderful, I mean, I did, this book I wrote partially during the you know, the lockdown part of the pandemic. And, and this is Lords of the Fly? Yeah, Lords of the Fly. And I would wake up naturally at 4.30 because I wanted to go hang out with the material. I just wanted to work on it. You know, it's just like, it's, and it's an amazing thing to find something that you willingly get out of bed, besides fishing, that you willingly get out of bed at 4.30 for. So it was awesome. That's right. That's what it is. Yeah, I yep. think that's a good way to put it. Like, what what are you willing to get up at 4.30 in the morning for? And, <laughs> right. And fishing, for sure. Anybody who fishes, probably most people listening, you know, have done that. But yeah, like anything. Who's going to get up at 4.30 in the morning? Like, you got to right. really love that thing or at yep. least or be forced to do it, right? Yeah, exactly. Today's episode is sponsored by Trestle, who has earned an exceptional reputation over the past few years in the fly fishing industry due to the popularity of their telescopic fly rod roof racks and statement-making artist series apparel lines. Their latest release for 2023 is the Jerian Universal Bike Rack Packing System, a brand new way to transport your fly fishing and outdoor gear. The Jerion will give any modern bike the ability to bring 30 pounds of gear with its front and rear articulated racks. Whether you ride a full suspension mountain bike, an e-bike, or even a carbon fiber road bike, the Jerion will get you and your fishing gear further faster and have much more fun along the way. I can tell you this has been a big struggle for me. I've been riding my bike, uh, both road bikes and mountain bikes, and had lots of issues over the years packing my gear, whether that's... Uh, crappy uh, storage on the back or a trailer that's just too big and bulky. So I'm excited to share this packing system, which is going to make it way more convenient and accessible to get out to the places you need to go. You can learn more about how Trestle is transforming the way you access your favorite water, backcountry, hunting zones, and camping spots. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Trestle right now and be the first on the water and the farthest upstream and away from the crowds. That's Trestle, T-R-X-S-T-L-E. Trestle, live your pursuit. So this book and with Saban, so that's it. I mean, basically, it's his history for and his it's his background, and you dig into yeah. that. It's called the the making making of a coach. Yeah. So it just and then it goes through the Alabama years. You know, of course, he's kept coaching now. So um, I may need to do an addendum here at some point. But it was a total blast. Yeah, it was great. That's it. Cool. And give us a rundown. I know you have a few other things going on. What are some of the other um, books you have out there? So I actually have a collection of Atlantic salmon stories. Was the first thing I ever did called Leaper. 
and it was like um you know the greatest writing about atlantic salmon and that was a really fun book to do i just moved to new york and i did my research at the anglers club of new york there was a wonderful lady there named mary and they gave me permission to do it they have arguably the best angling library in the world all these awesome old books and so i would literally go there have a cup of coffee and a very hard biscuit and uh you know read through all these things and it was really that, that was super fun so i did that back in like 2001 i think and then I did another fishing book called Sow Belly, which was about the quest for the world record bass, which was sort of sort of similar to this book, a little bit of a different demographic. And that was awesome, too. Like largemouth? Largemouth bass, yep, yep. Where was that caught? The record was caught in 1932 by a farmer in Georgia. Subsequently been tied like two years ago by a guy in Japan or whatever. But it was like, that was the holy grail. And so the, the book I was writing at the time didn't, in Japan guy came later, but it was about these people all over the south and in california who were who were just madly obsessed with trying to break this record same thing you know and then i did a book about uh called fourth and goal which was about a guy named joe moglia who was the ceo of td ameritrade had just led them beautifully through the 2008 crisis they didn't in fact they made money they didn't lose any money where or their their competitors were getting killed and he stepped away from the job at 60 years old to pursue his lifelong dream of becoming a college football coach um, he had coached a little bit in his 20s. He was the defensive coordinator at Dartmouth. So they're like the biggest long shot of long shots because no one took him seriously. They're like, oh, this is just some old rich coot who's trying to, you know, buy his way into this, whatever. But he paid his dues. He like was an unpaid intern at Nebraska for two years and coached, a, I don't know if you remember, the United Football League was one of these like um, offshoots of the NFL but that didn't last very long, but he coached the Omaha team. And then he finally, at the, at the end of the book, gets uh, a job. Uh, with Coastal Carolina when he he and he knocks out of the park, and so that came that one came before Saban, and then the Saban book, and then this one, and now I am I haven't started yet, but I've got a contractor right about the right about the set the the water crisis in the Southwest, but looking through the lens of Lake Mead. Oh right, wow. So not not fishing, not really. It's a biography of a place. So that's gonna be awesome. <laughs> that's good have you started the, doing the work on the uh you know kind of the reporting i well i, ha I have so it, it's more complicated than you probably want to get into but I, I i have actually so i i went i've been out to vegas a bunch and been out to the lake a bunch and interviewed a bunch of people but uh it's temporarily on hold because i have a, a project that might take two months that i've got to um that i'm going to do gotcha but you got this big big thing and when you look at these things, I mean, I'm just guessing Lake Mead, you know, is not going to be a happy, you know, story. Yeah. Hopefully, it's not a total terrible ending. But I mean, do these things? How do you deal with that? They, like you're in the weeds on it and all the negative, negative stuff. How do you stay positive in all that? What, like, how do you stay optimistic? That's a great question. I mean, I'm, I'm so back to Lords of the Fly. Like, I'm not optimistic about what Florida's doing. Um, you know, with their natural resources, I am somewhat optimistic that if enough people find out about it, enough people who care about it, find out about it, that something can be done. So I'm optimistic in that way. And I think that I'm going to have to take that same approach when I do this water book, because, you know, it's, it's not, it's not pretty. So the, the, the key will be to find, you know, you don't want to just a downer. No one wants to read a total downer book. You want to give them some nuggets of hope somewhere. You make them laugh. You make them laugh, right? Like you said. Exactly. So, but you got both. That's the thing. You're crying. You're going to be crying in the Lake Mead story. But you're going to be laughing. And that's what's cool about it. I see that that's the writing skill, right? That's why Gearock is great, is that, you know, he'll be talking about something. And, and yeah, you're laughing. But at the same time, then he'll break in something that's pretty deep and about a guy like his friend who died, who died of cancer. Yep. He's a great lyricist is what is. I love reading. I read, I read all of his. Yeah, I mean, his. his yeah, what does that mean? What does lyricist mean? They always seem like to have a melody. If that makes any sense, like his, it's very, uh, it's it's so smooth. He's so freaking smooth. It's amazing that it seems to have some sort of music musical element to it. Right, that's crazy, and and the way he does it too, because he takes his essays right and he combines them. Not necessarily, he doesn't even really have a theme or right uh, necessarily. Right. Yep. Of, yeah, yeah. I mean, he could be talking about. I uh, just read the latest one he did in Trout Unlimited magazine, uh, where he like goes to. Michigan, it doesn't catch a fish, but it doesn't really like, it's just this kind of, you know, almost feels like stream of consciousness. It's, it's really, his, his style is very distinct and there, man, there are a lot of people who try to imitate it, who do a very poor job. Right. Oh, there are, there's tons of people trying to imitate. Oh my God. I mean, it's so funny. I, I've off, I've often, I make this joke a lot because I'm one of these numb nuts who's trying to do this, but like to me, McGuane is the, the top. 
and the rest of us who try to do this, uh, you know, are just pale disciples, really. I mean, we just, you just can't, you know, he's so good that you're never going to even come close to it. So you end up being an imitator. If you're lucky, you can imitate to the point where it doesn't seem like you're trying to imitate and you've kind of got your, you've developed your own voice, which is how all artists, by the way, all artists start by imitating and then, and then develop their own voice, whatever. But I have noticed in the fishing community that there's, there are fewer people who try to imitate McGuane probably because it's just impossible to do, but man, there are a lot. It's like, you know, it's like when you were, when I was younger, all the novelists were trying to imitate Hemingway with the short, awesome sentences, you know, and like, it just doesn't, it doesn't work, you know? So anyway. That's right. What what about, the, this is probably not a fair comparison, but McGuane versus Gearock. And I know, I know John talks about McGuane's influence, but how, how do you look at those two as writers? Apples and oranges, just different. Dirty, I mean, so McGuane is writing, you know, it, it's just, it's just a different, it's just a different feel in the writing to me anyway. And I, I love them both. I mean, they're both on the Rushmore, uh, Mount Rushmore of the fishing writers, but very, very different. And, you know, McGuane is, what's interesting about McGuane is like, you know, he doesn't, fishing writing is not his. So for John, that's what John does, right? He's a, he's, he's an angling writer. For McGuane, angling writing was just something he kind of did on the side. I mean, he's, he's going to go down as one of the great short story writers of our era, for sure. Fiction. You know, he still publishes stuff in the New Yorker, which is the, the place to publish short fiction. You know, but I've always admired what I've always admired about McGuane is that he took his fish angling writing as seriously as he took his novels and his and his short stories. I mean, he really he really elevated the whole genre um, by taking it very seriously. So, yeah, they're they're very different, very different. They're different, yeah. What about what about for you on the the Forbes is interesting because that seems like that's this huge gigantic name, gigantic you know mm-hmm. that everybody knows about. You know, how has that been at the, at for, how did that, well, maybe just give us a little snippet on like how that came to be and then how much of has that influenced your career? It was a great, great. So it was like early 2000 or early 999 or 2000. I can't remember when I started there, but um, it was an incredible learning experience. I mean, they, so they make you when you get hired pretty much, you have to become, you have to start as a fact checker. So you, I'm checking the facts of, you know, some huge seven page story on Coca-Cola. Or something like that. So, so you sort of learn how to report. You learn about the the importance of facts, and you snip sources. You know, how does that work? And and I and I'm just taking a tangent yeah. here a little bit. And but on the fact, and this must be interesting because you're you're in it. You know, mm-hmm. and and without getting too political and stuff, it seems like the facts, right? Or or um, maybe has that changed a little bit on on what's being like the facts, like with the media? I just think because of the dissipation in media that there's not as much fact checking as it used to be. I mean, Oh, right. Because it's not a, it's because it's not a paper. Yeah. Right. Well, it's just, it's expensive to do, right. You have to have a, you have a team of fact checkers, right? So people, some, they just don't, they just don't do it quite as much. I mean, I know the New Yorker does it. I know the times, New York times corrects it, you know, does corrections, but that's not really, that's kind of fact checking after the fact, but um, Forbes still does it. But anyway, it was a great way to learn like kind of integrity in the whole, in the whole deal. So that was a great thing. And then you were a reporter and all this kind of stuff. So it was a, it was a fantastic gig and I wrote a lot of, I sort of became the profile writer. So I would go write about hedge fund. I would go, you know, they'd be like, go write about Paul Tudor Jones. And so I'd go write about, you know, I'd go spend some time with Paul Tudor Jones and write a profile of him. But I also had this incredible, these people used to snicker and sneer about this, but at least once a year and sometimes twice a year, I would do a boondoggle and go fishing with somebody oh nice and get that story in there i did a. I i went to labrador with uh yvonne chenard and tom brokaw i went to russia for for 14 days to fish for salmon i went all over the place so i would basically try to you know i would get at least one so they had kind of like a lifestyle page in the back so i would try to like you know do a lifestyle fishing story at least once a year and so that was fun as all get out you know so yeah so you're hitting and going with the, the top of the you know, like we said the you know, starting out with your book, you know, lots of big names, but Yvonne, I mean, right. Especially conservation, you know, it doesn't get yep. any bigger than that guy. What, yep. what was that like? I love talking about Yvonne. We haven't had him on yet. We're, we're hoping to get him on here, but what was that like? He's incredible. Actually, actually, we did two years in Labrador and then, and then we did another year in Quebec. Actually, I picked him up in Maine and we drove up to the Bonaventure. Um, he's just a really cool dude. He's very quiet for the most part. Um, very kind of contemplative, a very good angler. Just a smart, interesting, you know, you, he's kind of like a, a Buddha. Everyone kind of, when he speaks, everyone quiets down and, listen, you know, and, li- and listens to what he has to say. Um, he, uh, he had a really funny, we were in Labrador one time, we were fishing, and it was like just horrific 
black flies everywhere. And, and it was Yvonne, me and Bill Taylor and Tom broke on, and we weren't catching anything. And this, uh, across the river, this, this guy leads someone else out, out of the woods. And it becomes apparent that the guy being led is blind. And that dude proceeds to catch two salmon <laughs> in like 30 minutes. And then he leaves and we flog away for the rest of the day and we go home and we're all just like swollen and everything like that. And we, dinner no one talks at dinner and then we're just sitting there i never forget it yvonne is sitting in the corner he's kind of peeled the the label off his labat labat's blue and he he just starts rubbing his forehead he said man i tried everything today I, I, wet flies and dry flies and, you know whatever and he goes i even took a couple casts with my eyes closed <laughs> it was just crack i mean everybody it was the it was yeah. sort of the, the tension breaker right. that we all needed to laugh at ourselves. the perfect so, one yeah it was awesome uh, that is good. So he's got a sense of humor. What he would does. be your recommendation? We we had Craig Richardson on recently. We talked a little about, you know, if we've had some of Yvonne's friends and we've had Patagonia yep. on. What would be your recommendation if we wanted to get uh, Yvonne on? What, what's, what do you think uh, would incentivize him, you know, to come on a podcast? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't. He's a tough guy to get now, I think. Divestiture and all that stuff. I mean, Topher might be a good person to to try to try to get through to them. Um, yeah, yeah, Topher, perfect. Just because they still, I think they chat about double-handed rod fishing and stuff like that, but I don't know, McGuane, if you if you know McGuane, he, he would probably be, but I my guess would be, and this just shouldn't deter you, I think you should try anyway, but that he's he's just fishing and he's sort of, uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, he's out, yeah. he's gone. He's, he's, at, he's, he's, given, he's given away the company to, yep, yep. you know, it's a pretty amazing story. That's awesome. Yep. Cool. Good. Well, I think, um, you know, as always, we, we don't ever get into everything, but I do have a couple questions. Let's take it out of here for our, with our little yeah. rapid fire. Does that sound good to you? Sure. So I think we've been talking, I mean, I feel like, you know, obsession, you know, for me, for probably, I don't know, a lot of people you could probably look at that are at the highest levels and not saying I, I'm at the highest levels, but it feels like that's your books. You've dealt, you've interviewed a lot of, I mean, what is your kind of your biggest obsession? It was fishing for a long time, and it probably still is. Uh, it still is to a certain degree. I just, I, like I said, I don't. I got three kids, and I just don't. I just don't have the time to do it as much, which actually makes it sweeter when I do get out there. Um, you know, the kids for for sure, the family. You know, I mean, I'm definitely obsessed over you know how they're doing, um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed with I, I'm obsessed with writing. Uh, you know, I, I just especially when I'm into a project, like right. I am wholly into it. You know. Are you a, this is another, I love going back to the gear act, but are you more a, are you a writer first or a fisherman first? I like to think I'm a writer first. I mean, and I think the, the best, uh, or the better outdoor writers are all writers first. Um, I mean, gear act is a great example and McGuane is too. I mean, McGuane's a, you know, McGuane's a famous novelist and short story writer who writes a little bit about fishing. So I, I remember coming to New York looking for a job and I went and, sat down with a guy who was at men's journal at the time. His name's Sid Evans. He now runs a town and country. It's a great, great editor. And I said, I said, he said, why, why, what are you coming up here for? He's like, I want to be an outdoor writer. He said, don't ever say that. You want to be a writer. And it, that always stuck, always stuck with me. You know? I love that. I love that. And that could probably be spread out to other niches or, you know, thoughts, right? Like yep. almost, I always kind of think about like some of the stuff I'm doing, like, well, yeah. Am I a fly fishing podcast podcaster? Or am right. I just a podcaster? Podcaster. And I feel yeah. like, yeah, I feel like I am just a podcaster because there's yeah. all sorts of cool topics and niches that I think about my life. I would love to go into, right? Absolutely. I can see this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think what he was saying was, don't corner yourself. Don't box yourself in. Although I think it is good that we've talked about this, you know, a few times. But you know, the quote, "The riches are in the niches." I think it's a good place to start yep. because yep. you nail the niche and you become the the best in that niche, and then you kind of broaden out. And then another saying is write about what you know and probably podcast about what you know also works. Right. So like, you know, that's a good, good way to start. Yeah. Perfect. So we, Jimmy Buffett came up, he's obviously Margaritaville, right? All that stuff. I think some of that came down from those, that, that era. Um, but what's your music? Do you have a band group song that you would give us that uh, we could throw in the show notes for this one? <laughs> it's funny you should ask because basically I just got done car trip with all my girls and I'm basically a Swifty. Swifty? Yeah, pretty much Swifty. That's a fan of Taylor Swift. Oh, Taylor Swift. Yeah, we listen to there a lot go. of uh, a lot of Taylor Swift, and actually, they've started to introduce me to a lot of new music, which is some of it's good, some of it's really bad. But what what, what I love most is they're you know is they're 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 now starting to be like, hey, Dad, have you heard this? And it's like um, Pink Floyd. Oh yeah, they're coming back. Or Led Zeppelin. I'm like, yeah, no, I've I've heard this before. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's so, so good. 
musical tastes are very much influenced by them now. There you go. Perfect. Good stuff. And what was your uh, what was your sport? If you were going to go pro in a sport, what what would it have been? That's a great question. My best sport was probably soccer. Oh, soccer. I would have been the the uh, yeah. Uh, if I, my dream was to be the uh, starting goalkeeper for the U.S. Men's National Team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, when they finally won the World Cup. Oh yeah. When did you uh, in soccer? When did you realize you weren't going to be a pro soccer player? I would say at the my all at an all star showcase in. Um, at the end of high school, and I did I did play for a brief moment in college, but in that All Star Showcase, I think I had four goals scored on me. Oh wow, you're a goalie. Yeah, I was like, you know what? I'm probably not an All Star. I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. You know, so right. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That's awesome. Did, give me. So we talked to Lords. Well, you know, Lord of the Flies. Uh, what is the movie? Do you have a favorite movie you you have like old, new, whatever? I'm a big, uh, I, you know, if you had to nail me down to my favorite movie of all time, it would probably be Godfather 2. Oh, yeah. Young Pacino, a young De Niro, and just, a, you know, about family and about, you know, about duty and about obsession to a certain degree. I mean, that, so, yeah, I'd say that's probably my favorite, favorite movie of all time. Yeah, that's, uh, that is amazing. Right on. Well, like I said, we'll we'll leave. Uh, maybe we'll check back in with you when you get your next book out, yeah. and uh, and we'll circle Sounds around. Good. This is this has been awesome. Um, you know, digging into this a little bit, and I think you mentioned that you got some work ahead of you in the next kind of year. You, you when do you think this next project? Uh, well, the book. When, when do you think we can? Because this obviously this podcast is going to be live for a long time. When do you think your book's going to be coming out? I would guess this is going to take a while. Uh, I think it's probably take longer than any book I've ever done. I would think probably a year and a half to two years of writing it. And then, you know, from there, you know, it's up to the, the publisher at that point, but probably it right, could be three years. Yeah. It could be a hope, hopefully not that long, but it could be. Yeah. 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 So 23. So we're mid mid 23. So the great thing about this is three years from now, which is going to zip by us. It's going to be 2026 and you're going to have a book that people oh can check God. out. So, it seems like so far away. How old are you? How old are you? Uh, you have, you have three girls. I do 18, 16 and 10. Oh man! All right, let me just for a sec because I have a nine and eleven girls. Yep, it, it's not going to get any easier. I know that. I've already heard that story. How, how have you? <laughs> how have you survived? Lots of IPAs. Uh, no, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, the teenage years are they are definitely difficult. Uh, lots of emotions, lots of you know things to kind of handle. And I, I, I've always, you know, and we're not. My wife and I are not perfect at it. Uh, we certainly have screwed up a lot, but communication. You know, that's all. I just want to know. I just want to know what they're doing, what they're thinking. Yeah, you know? that's it. And then you just you just go from there. And then there's a lot of stuff you just have to kind of close your eyes and, <laughs> you know, whistle by. I know. I know. And, and they're so 18. So at that point, is it kind of getting to now um, the crazy times or, well, it probably never ends. But, I mean, it's it, you, you got college ahead of, right, potentially yep. and all that stuff. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's it's, you know, it feeling like you're, you're kind of feeling like you're getting a, a little bit of a control of the, or not control, but you know what I mean? Like feel better about it. Well, yeah. I mean, well, cert, to a certain degree when they, when they go off to college, you, you, you sort of have to relinquish your, you know, oh, your, right. that's you know it. there's yeah, not, yeah. not a whole lot, not a whole lot more you not can you do. Can, yeah. um, I have to say it's very sad though. When, uh, you know, when it you're, is. You're, your nuclear family that's been together for, you know, all of a sudden you get, you're missing for a large part of the year, you're going to be missing one of them. And that's a really, uh, Kind of a weird thing. She's graduating in a couple of weeks here, so you know it's all kind of well. My wife and I've been thinking about it a lot, but um, but it's great. I mean, gosh, I mean, yeah, can, yeah, it's great. Can you imagine how fun? I mean, uh, I just remember how fun college was. So you know, yeah, I know. I'm college is great. Yeah, college yeah. is amazing. That's why I told my kids the other day. I was like, hey, you know, you don't have to go to college. You know what I mean? Like, you can do anything you want to do, but you would probably be, you know, you'd probably be have, I don't know how I said it, but I basically said it'd probably be a good idea to go to college. Yeah. You know, <laughs> even if, you know, it seems like it's not even about the education, a lot of it, right? It's just about going and I don't know how you explain it. Like, well, there's that, so much, you know, yeah. yeah I mean, it's ac academic, but there's also a social education and, and being away, especially these days when I feel like you know, there's a lot of helicopter parenting going on. And you do a lot of, you know, it's like, it's good for them to, you're out in the world, man, like figure it out, figure out how to fit, you know, Figure out how to sign up for classes. Figure out how to negotiate this awkward situation socially or whatever. So yeah, I mean, I think I think it's enormously, you know, I understand. My uh, I have a, a nephew who's going straight to trade school, and that's awesome. Like yeah, I exactly. That's, that's that's killer too. Yeah. But you know, e either way, you got to you know, it's like the old bird, you know, time to leave the nest kind of deal. Like you got to figure you got to figure out those wind currents and vectors all on your own at this point. You know. Yeah, that's perfect. Perfect. Good stuff. 
All right, Monty, we'll, we'll send everybody out to uh, MontyBurke.com to, to check out your stuff. And, um, yeah, thanks for all the time today. This yeah. has been a lot of fun. Of I'm course. excited to dig into some of your other books and uh, looking forward to staying in touch. Great. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. There we go. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash 474 right now. 474. You can check out some of the show notes. If you want to just grab one of those books, find out what we're talking about, you can dig in deeper show notes there. And, uh, and we always have some good bonuses. Reminder, we mentioned this at the start, but if you have a chance, if you enjoyed this episode, click that share button and share it out to somebody that you love and would love to hear some of these stories. If they don't know about Monty, this is the chance to share the love. Quick listener shout out before we get out of here, Gary Madison. Gary Madison said, I am a longtime listener to your podcast and have responded to Ethan regarding his American-made products. I live in Pennsylvania and enjoy fly fishing for trout and steelhead. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary, for checking in and giving us the shout out here um, and checking in by email. I hope you enjoyed this shout out. Uh, Gary was referring to the uh, little giveaway we had with Stonefly Nets, Ethan, and the great products he has going over there. And it's awesome to hear that Gary checked in with Ethan on those American made products, which, of course, Ethan is kicking out and he does great work. If you want to support this podcast, you can check out Stonefly Nets right now or any of our sponsors. And, uh, and give them a shout out and let them know uh, you found them through this podcast. And that supports us in one easy shot right there. Thanks again, Gary Madison. If you want to get a shout out and you're listening right now on this episode, or actually on this podcast, you can connect with me. Just send me an email, dave at wetflyswing.com anytime or on social media. Okay, what is our random fun fact for the day? I guess tarpon is still one of those species that we've heard so much about and uh, and it's still one that I need to chase. I've got I've got some plans to get out there and do it. If you have some ideas uh, of how I can put that together be- uh, better just checking with me. And uh, I want to give a shout out too before we get out of here is uh, as far as if you're on the email list, if you're getting any of our emails and uh, and you want to make sure those get delivered, uh, the best chance is to reply uh, to any of those emails and let me know you're getting them. And they're not going into your spam folder. So just a reminder, if you are on the email list, that's a good reminder um, to continue to get those. All right, where are we heading next? Let's take a quick look at where we're heading next. Yes, yeah, a reminder, we got Steelhead Week coming up next week. So stay tuned for that. Uh, be ready. We're going to be launching off early next week. And we are going to be going all week long. Uh, we've got three huge episodes planned with a bonus uh, and we have a big giveaway event and some surprises this year we're going to announce when we get going on this one. All right, I'm going to get out of here. I hope you I hope you had a chance to connect with us uh, in the past. And if not, you can do that right now. And I just want to wish you a good afternoon, a good evening, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. And I appreciate you for supporting this podcast and checking in today. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.